Hello everyone, my name is Miguel Acostaloza and I'm going to be doing a presentation on Nestor Magno from Stalin's Soviet Union. Uh, this is from my History 102 course and my professor is Quibin Devara. I would like to get started with a quote uh, from Nestor Magno and it is burn their laws and destroy their prisons, kill the hangman, the bane of mankind, smash authority. And I feel like this is a really uh, good idea of who this person was. And he's been uh, described in many ways in the past. Um, he's been called a revolutionary anarchist, a peasant rebel, the Ukrainian Robin Hood, and even a mass murderer. Uh, all these epithets come uh, from the Russian Civil War. Now I would like to give a brief overview of uh, what this presentation is going to be about. Uh, Makhno was the commander of the Revolutionary Insurrectionary Army of Ukraine, and it's commonly known as the Makhnovshina, uh, which also can be roughly translated into Makhno movement. The Makhnovshina was a predominantly peasant phenomenon that grew into a mass social movement. Uh, it was initially centered around Makhno's hometown, Kuliopol, but uh, over the course of the Russian Civil War, came to exert the strong influence over large areas of southern Ukraine. Makhno and the movement's leadership were anarcho-communists and attempted to guide the movement along those same ideological lines. Uh, Makhno was aggressively opposed to all factions that sought to impose uh, their authority over southern Ukraine. And he battled in succession the forces of the Ukrainian National Republic, the central powers of Germany and Austria-Hungary, the Hetmanate state, the White Army, the Bolshevik Red Army, and other smaller forces led by various Ukrainian admins. He's also created as the inventor of the Tashnaka, a horse-drawn carriage with a mountain heavy machine gun. Magno and his supporters attempted to reorganize social and economic life along anarchist lines, including the establishment of communes of former landed states, the requisition and egalitarian redistribution of land to the peasants and the organization of free elections to local Soviets and regional congresses. Moving on to our timeline, let's go back to the origins. So Nestor Magno was an anarchist leader with peasant background who was born on October 27, 1889 in Julio Katerina's like Gubernia in Ukraine, of course. Um, his father died the following year and at the age of seven, he was put to work tending cows and sheep for local peasants. Later, he found employment as a farm laborer. Because of the injustices he experienced, Magno joined an anarcho-communist group he was arrested in two separate occasions uh, due to the group's terrorist activities. The second time in 1910, he was even sentenced to death for killing a police officer. However, the death penalty was committed to life imprisonment because of his young age. He served uh, some time in Bucherki prison in Moscow and Magna acquired general and political education from the prison library and from other political prisoners as well. Magna was initially placed in irons or in solitary confinement. However, he later shared a cell with an older, way more experienced anarchist named Peter Arshinov, who had been in prison for smuggling arms uh, from Austria. Over the next few years, he taught Magno about the libertarian doctrine that had been developed by uh, Mikhail Bakunin and Peter Kropotkin. Uh, this is where he actually consolidated his position as an anarchist. Um, and he was finally released on March 2nd of 1917 after the abdication of Tsar Nicholas II. This is another quote from Magno right after he was uh, liberated from prison. Uh, he, Magno later recalled, the February revolution of 1917 opened the gates of all Russian, Russian prisons for political prisoners. There can be no doubt this was mainly brought about by armed forces and peasants taking to the streets, some in their blue smocks, others in gray military overcoats. overcoats. These revolutionary workers demanded an immediate um, amnesty as the first conquest of um, revolution. The Tsarist government of Russia, based on the landowning aristocracy, had walled up these political prisoners in damp dungeons with the aim of depriving the laboring classes of their advanced elements. Uh, and destroying their means of denouncing the inequities of the regime. Now these workers and peasants, fighters against the aristocracy, again, found themselves free. And I was one of them. Moving on from the liberation of Magno. 
um, Magno actually returned to Juliaipo, uh, his hometown, where he organized local peasants, workers, and artisans, and headed the local Soviet of workers and peasants deputies. He also led peasant bands for the expropriation and redistribution of the states of the local nobility. In July 1918, he began to mobilize resistance to the central powers, and Hetman Pablo Skoporavsky, Magno led an insurrection against the occupying German forces and conducted raids on local states. As a military leader, he combined unorthodox tactics with a well-disciplined army, which was largely based on voluntary um, enlistment. The light mobile cavalry units he formed were key to his military success. These units featured innovative horse-driven carriages upon which machine guns had been mounted. Magno also had a meeting with uh, Lenin himself in the Kremlin, and Lenin explained his opposition to anarchists by saying, the majority of anarchists think and write about the future without really understanding the present. That is what divides us communists from them. But I think that you, comrade, have a realistic attitude towards the burning evils of the time. If only one third of the anarchist communists were like you, we communists would be ready under certain well-known conditions to join them in working towards a free organization of producers. Magno answered that the anarchists were indeed not utopian dreamers, but rather realistic men of action. Now we're gonna move on into the withdrawal of uh, the central powers after the struggle from Magno. Uh, the withdrawal of the central powers from Ukrainian territory in November, 1918, left Magno in a position of considerable strength in Katarzyna Gubernia. His forces effectively controlled the entire Hulaipol region for the first five months of 1919. In the spring of 1919, he was strengthened by the arrival of members of the Navid Confederation of Anarchist Organizations. They assisted in the cultural and ideological work of the anarchist movement by editing its periodicals Putkes, Vodka, and Navad. Moving on to the symbol of anarchy. Magno always had a large black flag, the symbol of anarchy at the head of his army. Embroidered with the slogans, liberty or death and the land to the peasants, the factories to the workers. Magno later told Emma Goldman that his objective was to establish a libertarian society in the South that would serve as a model, not only for Ukraine, but for the whole of Russia. When he set up his first commune near uh, Pokrovskovai, he named it in honor of uh, Rosa Luxemburg. Okay, moving on. Uh, Magna concluded a shaky alliance with the Bolsheviks in March of uh, 1919 against Anton Denikin, but resisted attempts to subordinate his command to the Red Army. On June 14, 1919, Bolshevik forces attacked Julio Pol and dissolved the existing anarchist communes. In July 1919, Ottoman Nikifor Kirov, whose army was operating in the vicinity, offered to ally himself with Magno. Magno refused by executing Kirov and bringing a large portion of the Ottoman forces into his army. The alliance with the Bolsheviks resumed in the summer of 1919 with the advance of Anton Denikin's volunteer army into Ukraine. Magnus forces were pushed back as far as human, where they encountered the Ukrainian Galician army and Simon Petilura's regular army of the Ukrainian National Republic. A brief pact was concluded with them on September 21st, 1919, but Magna continued to operate against Denkling forces independently. On September 26th, though, he delivered a major blow to the whites near Perhonivka and forced them to retreat. Now, the defeat of Anton Denikin and the beginning of a position of strength. With the defeat of Anton Denikin, Magna reached the pinnacle of his influence in Ukraine. His troops, numbering approximately 40,000, controlled about one third of the present territory of Ukraine and included a large population of roughly 7 million people. In 1919, Nestor Magno married Agafia Kuzmenko, a former elementary school teacher um, who was born in 1892 and died in 1978, who also served as one of his aides. 
they had one daughter and her name was Yelena. Two of Magnus' brothers were actually members of his army before being captured in battle and executed by firing squad. In October 1920, in the face of a renewed white threat emerging from Crimea, the Magnobites and Bolsheviks concluded a treaty calling for military cooperation and amnesty for all anarchists held in Russian jails. The offensive launched by Peter Wrangler's army was dealt with uh, very quickly, affording the Bolsheviks an opportunity to deal decisively with the supporters of Magna. They massacred a group of Magna soldiers returning from the Crimean campaign on November 25th, 1920, and then turned their troops on Hulayapol. Magno was forced to make a dash for the Romanian border and crossed it on August 28, 1921 with a small band. The remnants of his army in Ukraine were soon crushed. And now I am going to go over the end of Magno as a revolutionary figure in uh, Ukraine and broader Russia. In Romania, Magno and his band were arrested and interned. However, he actually escaped to Poland, where he was arrested a second time on charges of uh, fomenting rebellion among Galicia's Ukrainians. After being acquitted, he moved to dancing, where he was arrested a third time. He escaped to Berlin, and from there he moved to Paris. There he remained a very active anarchist in different circles, and contributed regularly to the international anarchist press. He also wrote his incomplete memoirs in Russian, dealing with events of uh, 1918. Mr. Magno wasn't happy in Paris, saying that he really hated the poison of big cities and missed the landscape of Hulepo, his hometown. According to Alexander Bergman, he had numerous talks about returning home and taking up the struggle for liberty in obscurity, poverty, and disease. And he really wanted to go back uh, and, and re reclaim social justice. Um, finally, uh, Magno died of tuberculosis on July 6, 1935. And that marks the end of my presentation. Now I would like to highlight a couple of the sources that I used uh, to craft this. So number one, I did some research on the Encyclopedia of Ukraine, and there you can find a link if you want to check it. I also uh, went over Spartacus Educational to find some more information. Um, there is a Marxist organization blog that I also used to find some other details about Magna's story. And finally, I used a, um, a paper from Harvard University to finish up my thoughts and consolidate some of the ideas that I already had. So thank you so much. I hope you have a good day. And see you in class. Bye-bye.